just by moving just all right <laughs> um just by muting yourself while hosts are speaking and using appropriate language in the call in the chat and just be polite to everyone in the chat and in the call um and for any like don't ask diagnostic questions so um we do have you know doctors pas and as our guest speaker here today and just don't ask them about like you know any medical issues that you're having i think that is um not the time for that um but but uh the chat is always open for hyping it up and just asking your personal your other questions that you have for the guest speaker or the board members um if there are any disruptions or people that don't respect the zoom meeting isabel will kick you out possibly i mean i don't know what she would do but i, I would be scared um and just know that this meeting is recorded and it will be posted on our youtube channel um so although we highly 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 encourage you guys to turn on your cameras um you also don't have to because it will be posted so it's whatever you're comfortable with next slide so if you want to potentially win a free prize at the end of the year please participate in the attendance point system so to earn the full amount of points for each meeting you need to sign in on, at the beginning of the meeting and sign out at the end of the meeting with the word of the day for a total of three points if you didn't attend the meeting live, you you cannot you will have 24 hours to complete the Google form and you can still earn partial points. And like I said, at the end of the year, the member with the most amount of points wins a free prize. Also, you can earn bonus points if you participate in extra uh, in, in community service events such as getting vaccinated. If you if you have proof for getting vac vaccinated, such as your vaccination card, you can earn extra points. Oh, and then here is a sign in and sign out sheet for the attendance. Oh, yeah, just sign in, sign out sheet. You can scan it right now. Yeah. I realized I said winter quarter. I meant to say spring quarter, but it's okay. We're almost ending. So my mind's already at summer, but that's not. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. If anybody is still you know, scanning this, just message in the chat and we'll send the direct link. All right, so we have a few upcoming events this quarter. Um, we're so excited. So uh, as today we have, um, we have, oh my God, I do not want to mispronounce the name. Doi, is that how you, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> Anyways, and then, and um, we also have on upcoming on May 7th, uh, a student guest speaker, Alec Larson. So he's going to talk about his journey and his time as a PA. Um, but yeah. Okay, and once again, uh, if you guys want any, check out any opportunities or shadowing or any other resources for pre-med or PA, go ahead and check out our website. There's the uh, code right there, the scanning code, and that'll bring you directly to our website. You can check more uh, of those resources on there. And here are all of our socials. And you can see that we have our Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and our Gmail handles right up there. And you can join our emailing list with the QR code on the left. And I see some new names in the group over here. And I'm really glad that you guys all came. So feel free to join our email list to get notifications about our upcoming events and any other important links such as all of our um, social handles are also in the link tree, QR code on the right. And also special announcement, we'll be starting our officer applications for the next school year, for the 21 to 22 school year. So uh, we haven't announced officially yet. So you guys are getting the first hearing for this. And you can see the application with the QR code. It's in our link tree also. And they will be due on Friday, May 28th, which is about a month from now. So that's a lots of time. And feel free to tell anyone else who may be interested. And the details and everything are in the application as well. Amy, you're mute. Amy, you're mute. Yeah, Amy, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as I was saying, um, so here we have our guest speaker, 
Um, his name is Yi, and he will be presenting his experience as a chief pediatric scribe, as well as an incoming DNP student. We are so honored to be hosting him today. Um, Yi, this is all you, go. <laughs> thanks for coming in today. Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. Um, hi, well, I guess, uh, so my name is Yui, uh, like, like I'm a U-turn. Uh, that's my English name. <laughs> Yi is my, uh, my Vietnamese name. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Yui and I am a chief pediatric scribe here at an outpatient clinic uh, within the greater Seattle area. Um, yeah, it was nice to meet all you guys. Um, oh, uh, next slide, please. Yes. So I guess like we're gonna just go through a little introduction about myself and then uh, discussing uh, what I did within my gap years, um, emphasizingly S, <laughs> um, and exactly what is a DNP and what my title will be consisting of and what, what I would be, um, and, and I guess like the, the mode of practice with the, my, uh, my title entails. And then uh, lastly, just a glimpse within like my daily life as a pediatric scribe and a scribe in general. Yeah. Uh, so just a little about myself. Uh, I was born in Vietnam and I moved here when I was four years old. Um, and I lived in uh, Washington for the majority of my life. It's 22 years now. Wow, I'm getting old. Uh, and outside of medicine, and if I'm not like fixing or extinguishing fires here in the clinic, I really enjoy rock climbing. Um, I'm actually uh, climbing with one of our doctors later after work today. Um, uh, other than that, I really love to hike um, there. If you guys have never been to Washington before, I highly recommend you guys to come and visit. We have an amazing mountain range here and the Northern Cascades are phenomenal uh, around this time of year. Uh, and that really plays along with my uh, love for photography. Uh, Shane Spelge, if you guys wanna check out my uh, photos on Instagram. Um, but yeah, um, and I, like you guys said, I will be, <laughs> I will be attending a Seattle University's Doctor of Nursing Practice program in, uh, I guess, one and a half months now. Yeah, and that's just a little split, a snippet of my projects that I do within photography. Sometimes I do small projects with other um, uh, content creators within the area um, for Halloween, or I just do mainly landscape photography and when I'm up in the mountains. Um, uh, next slide. Yeah, so I went and did my undergrad at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I majored in biochemistry uh, with a minor in chem. I know it sounds really redundant, but uh, I found out that my, I met, I met the criteria for a chem minor two days before graduation. And I just was like, what the hell? Like, let's just sign up for it too. <laughs> um, Initially, I was on the pre-med track, but then I decided that seven years is a really long time to be in school and learning. Um, so that's what made me a transition to the uh, nurse practitioner uh, role. Um, and I was very active within the BSA community, uh, which is the Vietnamese Student Association. Um, and I also worked during the time I was in college. Uh, I uh, worked at, a lab in Harborview Medical Center, which is our uh, level one trauma center in the area. Um, and we mainly did uh, research on uh, Alzheimer's and uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, which is like a, uh, think of it as like multiple concussions um, in one end, like you, it's, it's basically prolonged brain, brain damage. Um, after university, I traveled to Vietnam to help out the underserved uh, population there uh, before I found out about scribing. And um, initially first I was a emergency room scribe, but then I realized how much I hated the night shift and the graveyard shift. Um, working from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. is, it sucks. 
I mean, there's less, um, there's, uh, you get more autonomy in terms of like, there's no administration around and you can do whatever you want, but it just, you're so tired after like the, <laughs> the, uh, the four hour mark and you just want to sleep, but you have to persevere through. Um, yeah, next slide. <laughs> so the, these are just a couple of photos of my medical mission trip. Uh, in the middle there, we have uh, Dr. Mai Bi Huang, uh, which is our uh, family medicine uh, doctor. Um, I actually worked with Dr. Huang after clinic for a bit and I shadowed her at, she works as an inpatient, um, actually not family med, internal med, sorry. Uh, she works as an inpatient internal med uh, re attending uh, at St. Anthony's Hospital, which is in downtown Tacoma, um, not too far away from Seattle, around like 40 minutes. Um, and that's just a very small snippet of my team to the left there. And uh, below is a photo of me counseling a elderly couple about their prescription and their medication. So within my gap years, <laughs> uh, my, my gap years were very, I guess it's very unorthodox in terms of the track I went through. Um, usually as soon as you guys take one to two years for a gap year, I took three, almost four. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know uh, some, uh, some of my friends are, are graduating from dental school and med school this year and I, <laughs> I'm going in now. Um, but honestly, there is no shame in like starting late or really uh, taking time to understand what you really wanted to do. If I, I would say like right now, if I continued on my pre-med track, I would have probably been miserable. Um, and I would have hated and dread um, even applying to residency and being, doing the step one, step two, and even, um, yeah, just like the stress of being matched, that, that sound uh, pleasant. Um, so I really uh, took that time seriously to figure out like what I really wanted to do and like how I can do it in the most efficient way. Um, and one of the ways I tried to figure it out was to really give back to the community that I was born in. And um, I, I grew up in for part of my life. Uh, I found out about, uh, this medical mission called Vietnam Health Clinic through uh, v, v, VSA, sorry, uh, VSA. Uh, and one of their, uh, one, of, one of their coordinators just showed up and was promoting the medical mission. Um, and I, I just fell in love with the idea of being able to go back to my roots and exploring more about my, my culture, coming over here and like I guess like the most extent of my culture is through my parents which to be honest they're kind of westernized nowadays too so I didn't really have much of that um growing up uh yeah so yeah within the trip we spent it was kind of like uh, uh I would say it, I would describe it as similar to applying to medical school and it was very similar to, yeah, it's like, so initially you filled out an application and then if they really liked you, they asked you for an interview. Um, and if they really, really liked you, they uh, accept you or uh, they'll put you on a wait list um, if they have any other uh, openings. And yeah, it was a very exclusive uh, process. And Within like after I found out I was accepted, uh, we spent a lot of time doing benefit dinners um, and raising money for uh, fundraising money for uh, medical supplies that we can bring overseas for these uh, individuals, and even uh, prescriptions that we are able to uh, obtain or uh, have the pharmacies donate to us. And that was that was for a quarter of the year, and then. The other half of the year, we spent really training on the flow within the clinic and talk and learning more about optometry and how to assess a patient's visual acuity, um, taking blood pressure and vitals, or even like writing down the chief complaint, which is like a very big thing. You guys are gonna hear a lot about it, the chief complaint when you guys start working in the field. Um, it's basically, patients are gonna talk, want to talk about everything. 
but you have to really narrow down to what they really came in there for. And that's like the biggest thing that uh, a lot of, even like a lot of my scribes when I trained them uh, struggle with when they first start out is to really identify the chief complaint. Um, and yeah, so after, after we finished our training, we actually went there and we, um, we provided this care for, uh, for, for all these individuals within, within rural Vietnam. And when I say rural Vietnam, I meant like the jungle was like probably like 20, 30 feet away from us. It was, <laughs> it got pretty wild. And like there's thunderstorms during the time. I think we went, we went during the summer, which is like around, I think monsoon season around there though. So it was a little sketch. Um, uh, yeah, and then after, uh, so what really made me decide to take this trip was, um, I think I just wanted to, one, gain more experience about my, my culture, two, I really wanted to learn more about rural medicine and like really seeing how, um, how do I explain it? Uh, I guess like really, really seeing how much, how do, how do I frame it in like a really pleasant way? Seeing how, I guess, well, we are privileged here. Um, I guess it's like the best way I can think of it. Um, over there, I, I, I've seen a lot of crazy things in Vietnam. Um, there was a patient that had, uh, was in a motorcycle accident and half of his skull was removed. And at one point I was literally touching brain matter um, and there was no skull to, to, to form around the, the brain. And he was just complaining of a headache. And I, I was just like, you know, like I'm pretty sure over here we would be in the hospital and uh, like asking for narcotics or a pain reliever right now. Um, and it just really shows me how like resilient the human body is and resilient, um, uh, Med like medicine is in general and how we don't really need it, it, there's no we don't really need an ailment to everything and we can really treat it with simple remedies and which that really aligned with my my philosophy within medicine and the nursing model and that and so that really was also the contributing factor to what drives me to uh nurse practitioner school and then after, uh, after I came back from uh, overseas, I uh, looked into scribing uh, from, a fam uh, from a friend that I grew up with. Uh, I was shadowing a, a emergency room doctor at the time and coincidentally he was working as a scribe during that time and he told me all about his opportunity scribing and I fell in love with the idea of being able to learn. It's basically, free, uh, you're getting paid to shadow a physician and you're learning the diagnostic side of medicine and I, I don't want to sound like braggy but it, it kind of like within like the three year three to four years I have worked as a scribe and slash uh, pediatric scribe, uh, chief scribe uh, I have let's say enough information that I could be somewhat of a competent pediatrician at this point um, and I highly encourage a lot of uh, incoming um, the students that are prospective in medicine to really look into scribing. Um, even if you are in not interested in, uh, in the nurse practitioner route and, and, or in the, like you're interested in the PA route, uh, PA schools nowadays are starting to accept scribing as uh, patient care slash healthcare experience. And that's a very big thing because that really shows you how it's gonna it's gonna give you another tool within your belt to succeed within the intensive um, uh, within the intensive uh, learning curriculum of grad school. Um, and within scribing, you don't really need a certification or any requirements to start scribing, but just really you need to show like a keen interest to learn. Um, it's a very rigorous and demanding field. I'll say um, when I was working within the ER. Technically, this is illegal, but you don't really have a lunch. Um, like most pr providers work through the lunch and then they're just snacking or just eating along the way. Yeah, and even like here nowadays, like I, I rarely see my providers eat lunch. Um, and it really shows like 
their their tenacity and like their 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 resiliency, like just getting their work done. And I really respect that. So I was like, okay, you know what? Like let's <laughs> follow in their footsteps. And um, I just carried around granola bars or snacks throughout my throughout my shift and just raised on those. Um, but I always tell my new incoming scribes that scribing is basically you're taking four years of medical school and cramming it into a two month process. So within that time, you are learning about the diagnoses, you're learning about pathophysiology, you're learning about uh, how to identify the pertinent within the history and how to obtain and write a really good history for um, other providers to be reading uh, later on in the future. And that, that all of that really sets you up for success in your field in the future uh, when you're going to be writing those notes by yourself instead. Or also, you might want to hire a scribe and do all this for you. <laughs> um, and I think, like right now, there's three big, maybe two, because I think one of them merged, but there's two to three big major companies that uh, are liaisons for. Uh, big clinics as, uh, as, as scribes, um, as hiring scribes. Uh, one of them is Scribe America, which what uh, I'm affiliated with. Um, and the other one is, I think, Scribeology or Physicists. I'm not sure if Physicists merged with us or not, um, but yeah, so it, yeah, I'll type it out in the chat for you guys. Um, oh, wow, there's a lot of people messaging in the chat. Sorry, I did not see this. <laughs> uh, scribe America and Scribe all of you. Yeah, so I think these are the big three Scribe companies within the US um, that hire. And so it, it's, very, it's a very flexible hire. Uh, you can either sign up as part-time or full-time depending on your needs. I would really advise against scribing um, during your studies, you should really be focusing on studying at the time um, and getting through school. Um, and that's what your gap year is for, to really learn more about medicine, to have that time to uh, just have, to gain experience within the field and to uh, shadow other providers. Um, and also like, it's really rigorous. And so, I mean, unless you don't wanna sleep, <laughs> you can. You, I've seen people that have worked during, uh, as a scribe throughout their undergraduate career, but it's not highlighted. I would not, uh, I would not recommend it for, for everyone. Um, then, yeah, so, oh, I guess lessons that I've learned from my gap years. Number one, the biggest thing I would say right now is that your GPA is not it, your GPA is a very important thing, but it's not gonna determine your life. And it's not gonna be the end all be all. Um, let's play out some numbers for you. Um, I graduated University of Washington with a 3.2 GPA and in biochemistry. And I, before that, I have also, I also got my associate's degree at Bellevue College um, for two years. So with that, I have a 3.6, 3.7 GPA from there. Um, average wise, I would say that's around a 3.4. So, and I know there's a lot more competitive um, applicants out there, but it really should, what really will make you stand out is to take on these jobs as such as like a scribe or a, um, one of my friends who's in a PA school right now, he worked as a nursing assistant. And this is the job that really puts you in the front line and it really allows you to interact with the patients and <clears throat> to really learn more about medicine and like the flow within the clinic is a very, very, very good way to make yourself stand out as a strong applicant. <clears throat> um, the other thing is just make sure that you have a strong um, just make sure that you you really have a strong um, 
self-care plan for yourself? And actually that was one of the questions I had, uh, I was asked during my interview as a DMP applicant. Sorry. Um, yes, I was a transfer from a community college at first. So the reason, uh, so I transferred over because that was the most financially sad, or how do, how do I do? So going from a community college for two years and then transferring to a university, you save a lot more money than you're gonna go for to a university for four years. And I did not want my parents to, to break their bank for my education. <laughs> um, and so I kind of just worked my butt off to make sure it's like the most cost-effective way to obtain an education while also not bury me in debt when I graduate. Um, and I, I guess I'm proud to say that I was able, like my parents did not need to pay for my education and I uh, ended up graduating university with, sorry, I'm not sure if you guys hear like a baby screaming, but that's another page number. Um, uh, I, I graduated with only $5,000 <laughs> uh, in debt and I, I paid that all off within my first couple of years um, out of school. Um, so that, that was my reasoning on going the community college route um, first. Uh, lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, self-care. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, self-care is a very, very important thing, uh, especially when you are in healthcare. Um, I was actually talking to one of the providers here about um, self-care within, uh, as a provider in general. Um, it's really looked down upon uh, to ask for mental health um, help as a provider. And some providers actually could, are worried that they would lose their license if they um, ask for these mental health. Um, but if they go to therapy or if they go, it kind of like, cause I mean, you think about it, it's like, do you want a very sound and very emotionally stable provider? Um, and not one that's uh, very uh, volatile. And yes and no, um, but it's just more, it's, it's kind of like a, the damned if you do and damned if you don't kind of approach. And that's like the, I think like, honestly, in my personal opinion, I think that's like the biggest driving factor for why the suicide rate is so high for mental health, uh, for healthcare providers. Um, it's just, you kind of have to um, suck it up and kind of just having to find other ways to uh, cope with your with your with your emotion. Um, and I'm sorry that that sounded like jaded, and that's like a whole another can <laughs> that uh, we're not gonna go into. But um, yeah, so I would say like really develop a strong um, self care plan for yourself. For me, it's going out and just taking a step back and um, going to happy hour with my friends and just making sure that I'm socializing more. And that's a very big thing nowadays um, since everyone is remote. Um, it's, it's harder for, we're social beings and we really need to interact with other people. Um, and it's, I mean, I've seen a really high surge in anxiety, depression, and even eating disorders within the past year or so. Um, and it's really alarming to me. So that I highly emphasize like if out of like the whole, if you're not listening to the, the whole conversation uh, or like the, my whole talk, and it's okay if you aren't, because I'm pretty boring. Um, just, I want like everyone to take home that like your mental health is your biggest contributing factor to how successful you're gonna be. And I think like it make, having, preparing your mental, uh, a strong mental health plan early really sets you up for success. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure I deviated from the <laughs> slides a lot. Um, uh, let's see. Exactly. So that's what I was saying about like the damned if you do and damned if you don't. Like you, it, you're looked down upon for asking for help, but then also you're kind of expected to uh, provide help to others. It's kind of ironic. Um, so DNP. So what is a DNP? A DNP stands for a doctor. It's a it's a doctorate uh, doctorate prepared nurse practitioner. So within the scopes of the nursing model, um, if you want to advance to a provider 
role, there are two ways that you can do it. One is getting your MSN, which is your master's in nursing, or the other one is the uh, getting your DMP, which is your doctorate in nursing. Um, and both of them are very great uh, provider. And I would say like you have the same level of, of knowledge within the provider, but the DMP, um, within the DMP track, you get more of the administrative side and you really learn more about how to integrate evidence-based practices into your clinic or in, into your practice um, and even doing more research. And I think it's nowadays uh, clinics are looking for more doctor prepared. Um, uh, doctor prepared uh, nurse practitioners, but don't quote me on that. I, that's what I've heard. Um, but also it depends. Um, yeah, so I guess like within the nurse practitioner scope, you are a provider and you're gonna be able to prescribe medication. You're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be uh, giving uh, diagnoses. You're gonna be seeing your own patients. Actually, uh, I take that back. Within certain states, you're able to have full autonomy. So I think uh, in California, if you are gonna be a nurse practitioner, you're more restricted. Um, nurse practitioner. Yes, it is a nurse practitioner. So doctor of nursing practice, you are when, I'll get to that. Um, doctor of nursing practice is basically, you, it's just a doctor prepared nurse practitioner um, versus a master's prepared nurse practitioner. They both have the same level of knowledge within the clinical setting. It's just more, has, the doctorate level has more of an administrative side to it too. Um, and I guess like the pros and cons is just like you're very, the pro is you are a provider and you are going to be prescribing medications. You're going to be giving out diagnoses. You're going to be seeing your own patients, uh, depending on where you live is like the con. Um, for me in Washington, I would be able to have my own practice and I would be able to have my own patients, but within California, I might be working under another provider, like so another MD or DO's uh, license instead. Um, and I might be doing the same work, but, I'll, but I just, someone would be overlooking me. So kind of similar to how a PA would be uh, within those states. Um, is, yeah. Let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to read the chat and see if I can answer some of these questions for you guys. Um, I think there's actually a MSN, I can't remember the school. There is an MSN program within Cali. I, I think it's near SF or something, but um, yeah. Uh, yes, actually you can assist in surgery, uh, but it's very rare for nurse practitioners to go into the surgical route. Um, I think that's a little more common in, um, within the PA side where you have a more generalized uh, view of, of, of medicine. Um, for MPs, there's usually, so when you're going into the nurse practitioner role, it kind of splits up into five different tracks. Um, now I kind of, you know, I shouldn't say five different tracks because I have to remember all the five different tracks now. So for me, I am going to be working as, or I'm going to be studying to be a family nurse practitioner. This is more the malleable and I, it's a, it, this is the more versatile um, track and you can do a lot more with this track. The other ones are, um, oh boy. There is one for critical uh, acute care, uh, which is like working within emergency room or within the um, within the urgent care setting. Uh, another one is uh, midwifery, so you're assisting in delivery and uh, labor and delivery. Uh, and the there's the oh the uh, Ger geriatric one. So you're more focused on the older side of the uh, age spectrum. Uh, so you're more 
I guess like that's for more comorbidity management and like managing chronic conditions. Um, yeah, so the difference between a nurse practitioner and a, I would say like an MD or a DO is that I don't really need to go into residency afterwards. I can start practicing once I get out of, um, once I get out of school. Though I can go back to residency if I want to work in a specific specialty. So like if I want to do endocrinology or if I wanted to actually do surgery, there are residencies for it, but usually you're kind of, <laughs> you, you, you go in the track knowing like this is like what you really want to do. Uh, for me, I really enjoy primary care and I love to see from the moment like uh, a patient is born to throughout their whole life and being able to like remember the patient instantly when I see their name. That's like, that what, that's what gives me drive to like really go into primary care and really go into medicine. Um, uh, versus like the other, uh, I'm not saying like the other uh, fields are bad, but the other ones you have less of a uh, connection with your patients. Um, it, it's just more of you kind of treat their disorder and intermittently follow them up um, as needed. Um, yeah, basically it's preference. So like for me, I knew that I wanted to go into family medicine or pediatrics and there is a family medicine track for nurse practitioner. So it's just, I just go straight into there instead of like going through medical school and having to go through another three years of residency and um, to, to be a pediatrician. That's it's just a lot more <laughs> hoops I have to, to jump through in order to do the exact same role. Um, I, would, I would say that the prereqs for nurse practitioner school is very similar to uh, the, the PA route, I would say. So usually you have to take anatomy and physiology. You have to do some form of general chemistry some calculus and statistics, I think. Um, my school did not require any additional um, testing. So like you don't have to take the MCAT or the GRE. Um, I think it's kind of BS to be honest, like the GRE is more, I feel like it's more for um, that, that PA schools that need to go into, uh, to take the GRE is this very linguistic base and doesn't really, makes sense in my opinion, but MCAT definitely makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, I guess like that's a very uh, incentivizing thing with the, um, with, with my school is you don't really need a GRE, but they really focus on your, one, your resume, uh, two, your personal statement, and three, your letter of recommendations. Um, yeah, so, and uh, within my schooling, I'm, it's gonna be four years. I think with the master's degree, it's around two to three years, depending on the school. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about scribing now. Um, <laughs> so I have been a scribe for almost four years now. Um, the reason why I've been here for so long is I did not know if I wanted to continue being uh, going the MD slash DO routes or if I wanted to do something else. Um, and I knew that, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, so I, I usually don't tell a lot of people this, but my, so DNP, like the NP route was my first choice because of the autonomy. Uh, with with it, um, usually with PA route, you're working underneath a provider's uh, another doctor's um, license. And initially, I was like, okay, if I don't get into DMP school, then I'm gonna apply for PA school uh, because honestly, I don't really care about like the title. It's just more of like me being um, it'll just be less autonomy, and I'm okay with that. But I got in um, to DMP school, so I didn't really need to apply for the PA route. I would recommend people to apply to both. <laughs> um, but yeah, so back to ascribing. So I, I've been here for roughly, yeah, exactly, apply to both. 
Uh, I've been here for four years, almost four years now. Uh, my daily runaround is basically I come in at 8, 8.30 in the morning and I leave at five in the afternoon. Um, and that's what, honestly, that's what I really like about uh, primary care too. You have a set time instead of like working. I know the, uh, what I was talking about the doctor before, Dr. Uh, Huang, she works, I think, two weeks on, two weeks off. So she works five 12s and then uh, for two weeks. So 12 hour shifts, five days for five days. Um, and then she'll get the next week off, which is, I guess you kind of get like a small break, but working 12 hour, five days is kind of a lot, especially within healthcare. Um, and so that's, yeah. So it's a very uh, cushiony shift, I would say, within primary care. Um, and I usually have lunch around 12 or one o'clock-ish, depending on the patient load. Sometimes you don't get a lunch. Um, that's all part of medicine. You, you have a intensive visit. You really don't really have the time to eat or the luxury to eat. Um, I just bring snacks with me. Um, it's not really a big issue. Um, and sorry, I gotta move this. So lessons and skills from learning from traveling. So I would say you learn a lot about the puzzle, puzzle solving side of medicine when you're a scribe. Um, like if a patient comes in with, I'm gonna make up a random patient. Let's say if a patient comes in a uh, three-year-old, she is a uh, three-year-old female coming in with uh, vaginal pain. Uh, she's going to daycare. She is working on potty training right now. Um, and she has a past medical history of constipation. Like with just that information right there, I already have like three to four diagnoses I have lined up in my head of like what it's gonna be. Um, if she says no to something, then I know to like, this is gonna be ruled out and it might be the other two. Um, and if she says no to another one, then the last one has to be the conclusive answer. So it gives you that uh, idea of like, okay, like this is like the, this, these are the problems presented what are the most common way, what are the most common symptoms within this age group, within this, um, that are also presenting with the, these similar symptoms? Um, so like right now, I would think like, okay, is it like she's stool holding? Is it uh, something called bull vaginitis where she's not wiping adequately? Or is it a UTI? Is like the three things I would think about. Um, and you really don't have that, um, that tool belt in, or like really develop that uh, if you're working, let's say as like a lab tech or something, um, it's, it's a really hard and really big learning curve to overcome. And the earlier you start on it, the better you're gonna be and the better at diagnostic medicine you're gonna be. Um, uh, with my experience as a chief scribe, um, oh boy, I, would say that I am on call basically, quote unquote on call um, every day of the week. Um, so if let's say one of my scribes called out sick because of a COVID exposure or they have COVID like symptoms, um, I would have to find coverage. I would have to communicate with the other scribes um, and my doctor about that. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, and then um, let's say if they plan on vacation, I have to work around the uh, the schedule, I work around the schedule and find the adequate coverage for them to take that time off. And, you know, people need their time off. We can't just be working our whole, uh, throughout the whole year, otherwise we're just gonna <laughs> burn out. Um, yeah, so that's, that's more of my administrative aspect. Um, and also like I am in charge of hiring new scribes. Um, also, I have the power to fire scribes that I think that are not doing a great job or I think that have broken some rules um, and it, it are not very um, attentive to uh, the warnings that I have given them. Um, and lessons and skills learned from scribing. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, well, I, like emphasizing earlier, the um, the diagnostic and the puzzle solving side of medicine that 
is a very valuable thing to have. Um, and I would say that you really come in to scribing prepared to learn more about the overall aspect of I'm just checking the time if I needed to go back or not. Uh, uh, needing, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, someone, someone have a cue of like what I was talking about? <laughs> All right. Anywho, I guess like it's just more of uh, just like the overall aspects of, um, of, of learning like uh, SIG codes, like what does uh, twice a day stand for? Or what does uh, three times a day stand for? Or even like what to ask a patient, uh, <laughs> uh, what to ask a patient when um, you are like in a position of a provider, like uh, what are the modifying factors? Uh, what causes this to, uh, what causes alleviations to these symptoms? Uh, have you been taking like um, telling on ibuprofen for it or um when did this start and like you start seeing like oh like what are the important questions you're starting like you need to ask in order to like get the information that you need and yeah that that it makes you a better historian in that way um and and i would say that is the biggest driving factor of the you know, answer that you're able to really learn more about like the diagnostic side as well as you're developing that relationship with your doctor like right now i'm gonna go climbing with one of my doctors after after this um i've gotten happy hour with uh, a couple of my doctors like i had a doctor um a, a, another chief scribe that was leaving i was there for her going away party and he bought us all tequila shots like it, you kind of learn more about the doctors and kind of like really get uh, general sense of like, oh, like these doctors are also human like us. And I, I think like a big thing that um, uh, students do is they kind of put like these providers in a, uh, on a pedestal. And you just have to know like doctors also like make mistakes and doctors are human like us. Um, I do work in, a, uh, I wouldn't say a private office, but it's a private pay, uh, practice. Um, yeah, is that what we're trying to, uh, I don't know if I answered your question there, but yeah, let me know, let me know if I need more explanation on that, but it basically there is like a, a, a more um, public side to it, like you're, there are a lot of providers are more open to taking uh, state insurance and here is just more of you take on, there are providers here that take on state insurance, but I would say the majority of them you don't, don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, uh, next slide. I don't know if there's enough time to do scribe activity, so we can just like skip it and go straight to Q&A if you'd like. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, why don't we do a QA? and a Oh, sorry to interrupt. Before we do that, um, we're just gonna take a quick picture before everyone has to go. <laughs> okay, one second. Sorry, I'm trying to log into my work computer to check the next patient. Um, okay, yeah. All right, why don't we take a photo? Okay, so um, we'll just do the... Oh, shoot. Um, and 